Hello. We've reached the time of our first test, and this first test pertains to uh, Plato's five dialogues, just the Apology and the Credo, and Plato's Phaedrus, um, just the first 49 pages. Right? So it's not been a ton of reading so far, but um, I remind you, you are responsible for all of the video content as well. Um, so, uh, I'm recording this quick video to uh, just go over, this may be the only printed copy of the test, but nonetheless, um, the first test, which is due Monday, July 25th by 5 p.m. Um, there's a lot of boilerplate here taken from the uh, course syllabus. I describe, um, you know, the, the, the breakdown of the test generally. Um, it's out of 20 possible points. It's five questions worth four points each. Generally, I figure about a sentence, maybe more per point, um, but um, nonetheless, um, it's, I put a minimum here, and minimums are sort of funny insofar as they, they, they tell you how to barely satisfy the requirements. So um, you're advised to answer the question completely and use the minimum as the absolute bare minimum to get a bare pass. So, um, so these are short answer questions requiring roughly a paragraph or two for each response. Um, these should be answered in full sentences. Point form responses are far too vague uh, to be acceptable. Uh, when I do things on um, the blackboard behind me and my videos, it, I get away with point form largely because I'm there explaining it to you at the same time. So um, that's how that works. Um, so. Um, you're responsible uh, for this this test. This is the first of three. Um, if uh, you, you are finding that there is something going on in your life, um, like you're sick, there's a serious illness in your family or something along those lines, let me know and we can work something out. Um, this is a very quick semester, so we're not going to be able to do long extensions or anything like that, um, but um, a couple of days is possible. If you work with me, I'll work with you. And um, I'm going to remind you of the missed assignment uh, policy. Let me know either before the due date in question or within 12 hours of the due date. So the evening of Monday, July 25th would be the cutoff for possible exceptions. You just have to communicate with me. Send me an email, tell me what's going on, and we can work something out. I'm not trying to be a jerk. I just need you to, like, work with me on that. Um, assignment submission, uh, I'm going to remind you that it's your responsibility to um, make sure that your document uploaded to Moodle and then on top of that make sure it's the proper document uploaded to Moodle. Um, in the past I've had a number of assignments from uh, other classes submitted as the assignment from my class. Um, you got to make sure I get it, right? So um, that, that's your responsibility. Um, and in terms of plagiarism, I know it's very tempting to go on like Sparknotes or Wikipedia and just grab that, um, the, the, the wording from there. But um, these should be, and your best marks are going to come from putting your understanding in your own words. And if you grab something from a web resource or a book or something along those lines, I've been doing this a long time and I know the resources very well that are out there. Um, there's key terminology. I know that I didn't give you, but if you're using, then I, it's really, really easy to actually spot somebody um, who's, who's relying on undocumented sources. And I mean, with everything in the news about the Trump campaign and plagiarism right now, it's, um, you, you might want to say, what, what, what's the big deal? But um, it's it's a big deal. Like like I explained in um, the welcome video, this is sort of the cardinal sin for for academics, right? Because largely the name of the game here is to be able to generate our own sort of theoretical engagement with this material, right? So if you bypass that step, um, effectively what you've submitted bypassing that step is worthless in, term of, in terms of the course. 
OU has strict policies on plagiarism, and my course policy is if I find you've done it on, like, let's say there are five questions here, let's say you do that on one question that you're struggling with, where you just cut and paste or grab something from a different source and present it as your own, you fail the course. It's just not worth it. It's just not worth it. You're best to sit down and do the work, and right? Really, it's the only way to pass this course. So. Plato's Five Dialogues, Apology, and Credo, um, Plato's Phaedrus, um, uh, just the first 49 pages, uh, video material, My Socrates video, Rick Rock, Roderick Socrates in the Life of Inquiry from 1990, uh, Philosophy, A Guide to Happiness, Socrates on Self-Confidence, that's the one with Landa Baton on his cheesy little moped driving around uh, Athens. I kind of like that, and I kind of like the metaphor of the, uh, the, the pot being well crafted and several rigorous steps in order to get the thing to hold water. Well, a moral argument actually has the same sort of thing. Then in terms of the Plato material, um, Plato, Phaedrus video, my video, um, it's an old one, but it, it's actually one of the first hits. If you Google Pla Plato Phaedrus, it comes up under videos as one of the first hits. That's kind of amazing to me. Nobody else's video really does what I need it to, so... Um, then, uh, Plato's Theory of the Forms, um, that's, that's that Randy Ost or August or whatever his name is. Anyway, it's a, it's a good introduction to Plato's Theory of the Forms in just plain language um, with bad music behind it. And then the School of Life Philosophy Plato um, a, a video as well. These, these are video content. It, this is part of the core requirement of the course to actually screen through this video content and think about it. So, um, it, it, a paragraph or two for each response, um, full sentences, no point form, four points each, total 20 points. Um, what did I give you here? Um, it's two Socrates questions and three Plato questions. And again, I'm doing the distinction between the early works of Plato as Socrates and the later work of Plato as Plato. And you can see that the Socrates here claimed to not to know anything, and the Socrates in this, in Plato's Phaedrus, actually has a robust metaphysics where he's actually trying to explain the underlying nature of truth and how we come to know it. So they are distinct positions. I think it's a fair point to make the distinction. So Socrates, on page 35 of the Five Dialogues, presents an argument where he compares himself to a gadfly. In what respect is he like a gadfly, and why is this important by his argument to the city-state of Athens? Right. So, interestingly, you should break these questions down into their parts. Right. So, I direct your attention to page 35, the gadfly argument here. I start off by asking you to do two things, right? One, unpack the metaphor of the gadfly, Socrates, gadfly, city, state, Athens, uh, noble but sluggish horse. In what respect is Socrates like a gadfly? In what respect does he bite the city, state of Athens? So first, unpack the metaphor. And second, why is this metaphor sort of potent? Right. Why does Socrates underst understand what he's doing to be important to the city-state of Athens? Right. And then uh, the third thing I'm asking you, note it's four points, so um, it's, it's a heavily weighted question for me asking you to do three things. Um, how might this argument be used to support a case for freedom of speech and, by extension, freedom of the press? Right. So um, it, the, that last part of the question in uh, my experience with these courses is where people sort of drop the ball a little bit um, on in terms of the gadfly argument. Right. So it, basically what Socrates is saying is that there is an important feature of his work that pertains to the proper functioning of a democracy. Right. A democracy is one of those places, is, is one of those political systems where each of us rule, in a sense, and are ruled. Right. So, as Roderick put it in his video, in a democracy, nobody should 
be persuaded by any force in the context of a democracy except for the unforced force of the better argument. Right? So, if this is so essential to democracy, right, what sort of rights does this imply a case for? Right? What sort of behaviors should be protected if this is an essential feature of a democracy? Right? So um, that's the inference that I'm trying to get you to follow there. Um, so that's question number one. Um, question number two, in his fictional conversation with the laws of Athens, Socrates introduces the distinct but related notions of the social contract and tacit consent. Define each of these notions, distinguish him between them. Right. So largely what I'm looking for here is define social contract, define tacit consent. They are distinct from one another. Now then go on to tell me in what respect they are distinct. Now interestingly in the Credo there's this whole argument that leads up to this notion of the social contract and tacit consent. Right. Um, no, that's back in the apology. Here's the credo. I'll pull out um, the argument for you. Right? Um, do 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 do. Um, it, Socrates' position: We should always do the good, and right? we should never return evil with evil. And when we make an agreement, should we welch on it, or should we actually fulfill the agreement? Right? Of course, because we should always do the good and never return evil for evil, we should fulfill our agreements. Why? Because we should always do the good. Then, um, it, the, the laws of Athens say to Socrates, was that the agreement between us, Socrates, or was it to respect the judgments of, that the city came to? Right? So he's pointing to a formal agreement between citizen and state here. Right? Now somebody might complain, oh wait, how did I agree? Tacitly. That's the mode of agreeing to the agreement. Right? So I'm giving you quite a lot on this video. Right? So I've just broken down that question for you. Um, so it's really it, probably the best answer to that kind of question would follow this argument in order to arrive at a definition of tacit consent and the social contract. Right? So that's question two. Um, those should be fairly straightforward. Um, it's, it, I'm aware that I'm just sort of spot checking your understanding of this material because it's, I mean, in, in such a truncated sort of test, I'm not going to Hey, like there's Socrates' moral position. Why was he the wisest man in Athens? Um, what's the nature of his wisdom? And what does this say morally about how we ought to engage? What sort of political system does Socrates' argument support? Um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There's a lot in these two texts, right? In fact, in these two texts, Credo presents a theory of justice and Socrates presents a theory of justice. They're at odds with one another. There's a lot in these two texts, but um, I'm asking you about the gadfly argument and um, the, the distinct notions of social contract and tacit consent, just to kind of spot check that you understand. If you're using Socrates for your paper, you'll be expected to engage with a more robust treatment of his position. Now, moving on to Plato and the Phaedrus. I like this dialogue. I do. It's, I've been teaching it for quite some time. Um, it's the one place where you find the metaphysics, epistemology, and ethics all within 49 pages of one another. Um, it's on the subject of love, which is kind of cool. Um, Plato introduces a distinction between an inductive and a de deductive argument early, early, early on. A uh, persuasive argument versus an argument to what's truest or best early on in the Phaedrus. There's a lot in um, this particular text, but I had to boil it down to three questions. So I asked myself, well, if at the end of this course I'm actually signing off saying that you know Plato, what three things would you have to absolutely understand to actually qualify as knowing Plato? Well, here they are. 
briefly discuss the constitution of the soul offered by Plato at the start of the second speech. I can't be clear enough here. Um, it, the, 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 the second speech, um, there's Lysias' speech, there's Socrates' first speech, then there's Socrates' recantation. Socrates' second speech um, begins with the, the, the three kinds of madness. That's not what I'm looking for. Um, though it is a three, these guys are fond of their threes. Um, the second speech, where he starts talking about the soul, he gives that really awful argument for the immortality of the soul. That's not what I'm referring to. Just, just do 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 do. Just go la la la. It's it's a messed up argument for the immortality of the soul. In the video, I gave you the argument from recollection, um, which is actually a stronger argument for the immortality of the soul, or at least that demonstrates that the soul, by that argument, must be more durable than the body. But um, that's not what I'm looking for. What I am looking for is on page 30, where he says, that then is enough about the soul's immortality. Now here is what we must say about its structure, its constitution, how it's made, what, what its parts are. To describe what the soul, uh, what the soul actually is, we require a very long account altogether a task for God in every way, but to say what it's like is humanly possible and takes less time. So let's do the second in our speech. Let us then liken us the soul to the natural union between a team of winged horses and their charioteer. Again, he gives you a metaphor. Basically, what I'm asking you for in this question is to unpack this metaphor. So back to the question, discuss what the soul is like right, what its structure is, what the constitution of the soul offered by Plato at um, the start of Socrates' second speech where I just directed you. Um, so briefly discuss it, unpack the metaphor, right? How, by the argument offered in this speech, does platonic love bring harmony to the soul? Remember in the video I gave you, it basically platonic love does three things. It brings harmony to the soul. It gets us closer to the perfect truth of the forms. And it's the only morally justifiable kind of love relationship because it respects mutually. It doesn't treat the other as an object, right? So those are the three things that platonic love does. The first question asks you to describe the soul and talk about how love brings harmony to the soul. And two things, unpack metaphor, talk about how love can bring harmony to the soul. That's, that's, that's so two points for each, totaling four points. That's how you're assessed for that question. Now, question four, and I gave you that whole video on it, um, the, 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 the Plato's Theory of the Forms beginner thing. Um, that's why it's there. It is a 15-minute video that introduces the forms, right? Um, so I'm asking you to briefly introduce Plato's Theory of the Forms, right? Um, it make the distinction between the realm of the, the appearances and the realm of the perfect forms, and then tell me what the forms are, right? And that's... That's what I'm asking you to do for this kind of question. It is probably the most important idea, his theory of ideas, that Plato had um, in, in, in these texts. So um, it, I cannot, I, I cannot say that you know Plato without knowing Plato's theory of the forms. Right? That's why it's there. These are the basic sort of bare bones questions for Plato. So um, follow that video, um, follow my video where I discuss it. I, I think I use my cat Sheldon to um, describe it, um, it to, to, to break down what the, uh, the, the theory of the forms is, um, the distinction between particular and universal. You know, that's how the medieval philosophers um, it, it sort of engage with this same set of questions. And then finally, um, question five. Here is another question about platonic love. Um, now I'm asking about another thing that platonic love um, it does, right? So now we're on to Plato's epistemology, his theory of recollection, right? Um, and there's an argument for it. So kind of, and I break it down in the video. And um, Randy and his Plato's theory of the forms refers to it. Um, the beginner video as well. So you've got lots of resources to get through this. 
Um, and it's actually also in the book, right, where um, it, basically the character Socrates goes off into sort of epic poetry to discuss this, 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 this process by which we come to recall what the truth really is, right? Um, so, briefly discuss Plato's theory of recollection. Discuss how platonic love brings us closer to knowledge of the forms, noting the special character of beauty. Right? Now, um, page 39 is where Plato actually makes the argument about beauty. This is, this is it, his case for love being the fourth kind of beneficial madness. What's love good for? Well, first off, it brings harmony to the soul, but da 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 da. How does it get clo as closer to the truth? Right? This is really what Plato cares about. It's, it's largely love is our relationship with divine truth right? in a relationship of mutual understanding and respect. Right? So he's explaining here, well, that was for all, uh, all for love of a memory that made me stretch out my speech in longing for the past. He's referring to where he just discussed his theory of recollection and that sort of gods following perfect processions around justice and the good and wisdom as it really is, etc., etc. Um, now, beauty, as I said, was radiant among the other objects. And now that um, we've come down here, uh, uh, we grasp it sparkling through the clearest of our senses. Vision, of course, is the sharpest of our bodily senses, although it does not see wisdom. It would awaken a, a terribly powerful love if an image of wisdom came through to our sight as clearly as beauty does. And the same goes for other objects of inspired love. But now, beauty alone has this privilege to be most clearly visible and the most loved. Of course, a man who is initiated, blah, 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 blah. What's handy dandy about beauty? We can actually bloody well see it. Well, how, what does this have to do with Plato's theory of recollection? Well, it's the handy dandiest of the recollection cues. I mean, normally, if we're engaging in recollection, we would go from a particular triangle to the notion of triangularity, and that's how we would access the forms through recollection, because it's already sort of in there. The notion of triangularity makes a certain sort of self-contained logical sense. Right? Beauty, on the other hand, is accessed through our senses. Right? So beauty is one of those forms that we can actually bloody well see. Right? So what does this have to do with Plato's theory of recollection? Right. So um, I gave you a lot in this video, so um, you should have um, a good understanding of what I'm looking for for each of these um, questions. If you have any questions about uh, the test or what's expected of you or the content pertaining to any of these questions, um, please send me an email. I'll be checking um, often over the next few days. and. Um, I will be on the road, but I'm going to iPhone it and reply to any of your emails. Um, if you need a Skype meeting or anything along those lines, that should be possible. Like I say, I am on the road the next few days. I've got a conference in Toronto that I have to go to and then meetings in um, the Niagara region where I go to school. So. Um, yeah, so I, I am going to be on the road, but I'm going to be wired the entire time. So um, in both senses of the term wired. So um, if, if you need a Skype, I can set something like that up at a cafe or in a park or something along those lines. I've got a mobile hotspot. So um, please let me know if there's anything you need. Don't plagiarize. Let me know if the sky falls and you need an extension before or within 12 hours of the deadline. Make sure your submissions are actually submitted and that they're the right document. Um, and uh, I look forward to reading your responses. All right. All right. Well, um, have good days, one for each of you, and we will uh, communicate again soon. Take care.